Will you pray with me? Oh, holy and gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All right, quick question for you. It's Palm Sunday. Is it already Palm Sunday or is it, oh my gosh, is Palm Sunday ever going to get here? Right? I mean, I, I've, I've, I've heard this in lots of different places. I, uh, I even heard our bishop last week say, it seems like Easter's never going to get here. <laughs> Uh, because it does seem like it's a little later in the year than we're used to. I think we got used to it being early, and here it is late, and, and, and here it is, right? We're already at Holy Week, or maybe it's like, oh, finally we've been waiting for Holy Week to get here. Uh, but, but we do this with time, right? Sometimes it feels like time is going way too fast, and then sometimes it feels like time is going so slowly, right? You've had that experience, haven't you? Um, see, the thing is, is that you and I generally operate off of our assumptions, our expectations, uh, and, and a little bit of our feelings. And, and when we do that, we often miss things. For example, in our passage today, who cut down the palms? Anybody remember? Do you remember that? Do you remember who cut down the palms in our scripture reading this morning? Well, I'm glad you don't, because nobody cut down palms in our scripture reading this morning. If you want palms, you've got to go to John's gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they don't do palms. They do cloaks, right? The people spread their cloaks out ahead of Jesus. There were no palms, and yet here we are, and every Every year on Palm Sunday, we are all about the palms, as if it's always John all the time. Uh, but we do love to celebrate the palms. Well, let me ask you another question, see if you notice this. Do you remember what animal Pontius Pilate rode into town on? Do you know where that is in Scripture? Because it's not. <laughs> right? But it's a really important thing for us to understand. You see, if we're going to get serious about what Palm Sunday means and what's going on throughout Holy Week, then we need to know a little bit more about what's going on in the background. In other words, we need to pay attention to some of the details. And some of those details are in Scripture, and some of them can be found from history and from work that's been done to better understand that context. The Jewish people are living under Roman rule. It is not a pleasant Roman rule at all. It is very oppressive. Uh, it, it is almost barbaric, the ways in which the Romans subdued the Jewish people. So keep that in mind. Now, because the Romans understood that the Jewish people liked to gather in Jerusalem for various festivals, they were wise enough to realize that they needed to be present whenever the crowds were expected to come together in Jerusalem. And so the governor at the time was Pontius Pilate, and he did not normally reside in Jerusalem. He liked his little house by the sea. But when it was getting close to time for Passover or any other festival where they believed that a large crowd, especially a large crowd of Jewish people, would gather, boy, did he come to town. And when he came to town, he did it up big, and he did it up right. And so Pontius Pilate would have come into town on a war horse with troops upon troops upon troops with him. They would have made a grand entrance in the way of making a very big statement. We're here, we're present, and you better behave. We don't want any of this funny stuff. Don't anybody get any ideas that there's anything that you can do because we're right here and we have no problem bringing you down. Well, it probably didn't say that in the history books, but you know what I mean. Um, there was a letter that was written from the emperor, and I'm, I'm probably going to say names wrong because I know, I know nobody by these names, and so I'm not sure how to say them. Uh, the emperor Trajan, 
He was writing to Pliny the Younger. And in this letter, he said, When people gather together for a common purpose, whatever name we may give them and whatever function we assign them, they soon become political groups. Now, this wasn't written last week. This was written a long time ago, that whenever people come together for a common purpose, whatever name, whatever function, they soon become political groups. Well, congratulations, you and I are a political group. Now, I know how challenging it is for us to think about our faith and especially to think about Jesus and then to have politics come into it. We don't really like that, but here's the thing we, got, we, we have got to understand. Jesus was political. Now, politics was not the focus of Jesus, but because of the teachings of Jesus, because of the things that he did, the way he did them, everything he did and taught had a political implication. Okay? It wasn't that he was trying to change politics. It was that what he was teaching about the kingdom of God, what he was teaching about who we are as a people, butted heads with the politics of his day. I'm sure that doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> right. So let's keep in mind that while Jesus is not seeking to be political, the things that Jesus does has a political impact. And so, oh my gosh, what was he thinking? You know, you almost want to kind of tongue-in-cheek go, does he have a death wish? I mean, here he is coming into Jerusalem and making a spectacle of himself, right? He sends his disciples to go steal a cult, basically, right? You remember what he says? Go and you'll find a cult tied up, and if the owner asks you why you're taking, or if somebody asks you, just tell them the Lord needs it. And, of course, that happened. So, I mean, here they go sneaking off into town to go get this cult, but, of course, they get caught. But they're, okay, if the Lord needs it, the Lord can have it. And, of course, this goes back to fulfill a, um, a prophecy from the uh, Hebrew Scriptures. But here Jesus comes riding into town, not the same gate that Pontius Pilate would have ridden into, but the other side of town. Here he comes riding in not just on a donkey, but on a baby donkey. And the people are not tearing down palms to put in front of him, and the people are actually his disciples. Now, not just the 12, but the disciples that he has picked up throughout his years of teaching and being in ministry. And so they're taking their cloaks off. And I don't want you to get an impression here. I want to make sure that you're not thinking these are really nice cloaks. Because these people are a ragtag group of people. These are the people that you would walk on the other side of the street to avoid. Oh, wait, it's us. And so they take off their cloaks and they're laying them down and they are celebrating. This is a group of people who have been healed. This is the blind who can now see. This is the lame who can now walk. This is the woman with the issue of blood who finally, finally, finally has been reconciled and redeemed and brought back into community. This is a group of outcasts and misfits who have been redeemed because that's what Jesus did. And they are walking in this parade, and they are so excited because they have something they have no business having. Given who they are, they have hope. They have hope because that's what Jesus has given them. And the Pharisees, oh my gosh, it's so much fun to pick on the Pharisees, and we all want to really hammer in on them. But the Pharisees, at the end of the story, you remember what they're telling Jesus because the noise is getting so loud as all the disciples are singing their praises. And the Pharisees go, teacher, you got to get them to be quiet. Do you have any idea what the Romans are going to do when they hear this noise coming into town? Do you have any idea whatsoever? And Jesus says, it won't do any good to stop them. This is part of what I have to do. This is part of my ministry. This is part of God's work. 
And so he is making a huge political statement. Now, you and I can sit back and go, you know, Jesus, if you'd have just come in quietly, if you'd have just come in like the rest of the pilgrims and behaved yourself, not stolen any cults, not had all of this singing and this grand parade as you're coming into town, but if you'd just come in quietly, maybe at night even, things might have been different. And that's because you and I look at the story of Holy Week, and while we love the story of Sunday, we have a hard time with the story of Friday. Why? Why did that have to happen? And whose idea was it anyway? We know that Jesus has already told his disciples three times what's going to happen when he gets to Jerusalem. He is not walking into this blindly. He is well aware of what will take place. He is not looking for an escape hatch because he understands something that you and I still struggle with. He understands that it's not that God wants him to die. He understands that God wants you and I to know how much we're loved, to break down that barrier of death to bring forth salvation in a way that we just hadn't had before. And we don't get to go to Easter without going through Good Friday. I was ministering with a family, and this, these were friends of mine, so I felt like I could be a little more open. I was ministering with a family, and, and their loved one, the patriarch of the family, was dying. And the family, of course, is trying to get everything ready because when you know death is coming, you know that you need to make plans and preparations and somebody needs to write uh, a story for the newspaper. Have you ever noticed all the little good news stories in the newspaper, those obituaries? Those are little gospel accounts, witnesses to the faith. But anyway, so we're, we're making all of these plans and it gets down to, well, I think we should do it a week from Saturday. <laughs> and I'm like, I think we should have a body first. Because that's part of the process of what we go through. We are going to go through Maundy Thursday and the experience, that institution of Holy Communion, that time spent in Passover with the disciples. We're going to go through that on Thursday. And my guess is if we will pay attention and be open, we may hear something new. We're going to go through Good Friday, and we think we already know the story. But my guess is, if we will come and pay attention to the story, God may speak something new into that as well. And while I know you know the story of Easter, do you really? After all, who was it that cut down the palms today? My point is, this is a great week For us to slow down, to pay attention, to see if perhaps God may be speaking to us in a new way that could radically shift the way we see one another and we see the world. Because this week is the key week in our faith. May it be a key week for each one of us. Amen.